Your support helps us bring you programs you love. Go to wyomingpbs.org, click on support, and become a sustaining member or an annual member. It's easy and secure. Thank you. Lori Nichols was selected to serve as the University of Wyoming's 26th president three years ago. As her presidency nears its end, Wyoming Chronicle sits down with Dr. Nichols for an exclusive interview as she reflects on her work to expand enrollment, increase statewide outreach, and the importance of the university's greater role in Wyoming. UW President Lori Nichols, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you. And I want to welcome our viewers to this special edition of Wyoming Chronicle. It's our pleasure to be joined by the president of the University of Wyoming, the 26th president, and the only woman ever to hold the title of president of this university. Dr. Lori Nichols, welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Thank you. It's great to be here. This is the end of your third year here at the University of Wyoming, mm -hmm. and I think our viewers know that the Board of Trustees have chosen not to rehire you for another three years. But I want right. to ask you, has the university and have the Board of Trustees treated you fairly? I think that's a question on a lot of folks' mind. Yeah, I, and I get asked that quite a bit too. You know, um, it, it is a board's decision to make, you know, whether to renew a contract, who to hire for president. Uh, that's probably their major responsibility. I, I guess I would just say, I wish they would have handled it differently. Um, and by that, I simply mean I wish that there would have been more discussion about my performance and, and mostly for me just to know areas that I fell down in if, in fact, that was the case. And I also wish that I would have found out earlier because it came very late and very unexpectedly. And in my opinion, that could have been handled a little differently. Do you believe that you share the same vision for the University of Wyoming as does the Board of Trustees, Dr. Nichols? Um, you know, I, I would like to think that would have been the case, but in fact, that may have been part of the reason why perhaps my contract was not renewed is perhaps they felt as though other things should, should be emphasized and perhaps I wasn't emphasizing them at that point in time. I don't know. I, I've not been told, so I'm, I'm just not sure about that. I, I can tell you this, that when I came and interviewed for the job of the presidency, we talked about a lot of topics. Uh, for the university, and we talked about things that were either happening or not happening, or things that they wish they'd like to see happen. And when I came, I really focused on those things. I also had uh, really great conversations with then Governor Meade and several other leaders in the state, and I really listened to them in terms of their vision for the university, and I tried really hard to implement many of those ideas as well. So I felt like I tried to be responsive to what I was hearing from others, as well as just my own experience of what I thought a really strong university needed in terms of leadership. And as we get through the interview today, Dr. Nichols, I think that our viewers will be impressed of the work that you have accomplished in the last three years, and we'll give you every, every opportunity to, to talk about those accomplishments. But I want to start at the very beginning. When I first met you, it was in the middle of a legislative session, and you were just learning of the, the fiscal woes, and handed then a, an order to cut $42 million from this university's budget. Um, by all accounts, you've been lauded for the way you handled that. What did this university lose in cutting $42 million from its budget? You know, I think the major thing it lost was that we really, because the university's budget is so heavily invested in people, uh, the only way to make a cut that of that magnitude was to eliminate positions. I mean, we, we did other eliminations too. We worked on efficiency. We worked on saving on our operations budget and so forth. And we tried to save everywhere there that we could. But at the end of the day, we had to eliminate positions. And my recollection is, is we eliminated about 360 positions in order to make that $42 million budget cut. So really, at the, it, it lost people. Um, and I think that has probably been one of the hardest things for us to adjust to and then kind of come back from is the fact that we just don't have as many positions on campus as we once did. You took it upon yourself to travel the state early on in your tenure. Yeah. What have you learned that people don't understand about the University of Wyoming across the state? You know, I, I, I have to say, first of all, I am impressed with how much people do know about the university. And I guess that's part of being the only four-year 
uh, university in the state is that people really do know a fair amount about it. It's It's been quite impressive. But I think probably one thing they don't know is just, or appreciate perhaps, is the complexity of a university. I, I mean, we are about roughly 2,700 employees. We serve about 12,500 students. Um, you know, it's, it's a statewide university that tries to be very attentive to all the needs of the state. And I think just maybe the complexity of all the different um, priorities and uh, that one needs to respond to when they are running the land grant and the flagship university for the state. And I think sometimes when I talk with people and try to explain situations, they often say that is, you know, I hadn't thought about that. I didn't realize you were having that pressure as well. So that kind of complexity, I think, is probably something many people don't fully appreciate. Every now and again, and recently, um, you hear some folks saying, well, you know what, this state needs a second for your institution. Right, right. I've heard this that. discussion reared itself when the, um, you were testifying before, mm -hmm. um, I believe, the Joint Appropriations Committee on whether or not community colleges should offer bachelors of applied science degrees. Right. Um, I think I recall you saying that where you came from, South Dakota has multiple mm -hmm. state-funded universities and struggle, struggle fiscally every day. Right. Does this state have room for a second four-year school? You know, I, I based on the current population, I would say no. Now, were Wyoming to grow, and if it would be able to realize a million people, um, and you had that many more young people and adult students to attend, you know, to take care of, it might be possible to support too, but at half a million, it would be a stretch. It, because you can just imagine the infrastructure needs and the staffing needs to uh, take perhaps one of the community colleges to a full-fledged four-year state university, it, it would be a financial struggle for the state, I think, to support it. And not only that, but there's just not the student population to support it either. And I think the state would find themselves really struggling. This university has grown yes. under your tenure. And mm -hmm. I think you're quite proud of that. Can it continue to grow? And can, can community colleges grow simultaneously? I think so, um, because if in the current structure, um, there is, uh, you, I, I would just say this, that Wyoming has a fairly low educational attainment rate. And that simply means the number of people in this state who hold some form of post-secondary credential or education is relatively low. And in addition, the college going rate of high school graduates in the state is relatively low. About 55% mm -hmm. of high school graduates go on to some form of post-secondary education. Nationally, the average is about 70%. So we have a good 15% or so that we could rise even just to meet this, the national average. And I think if you put all that together, there is in fact room for growth and there's even room for growth within Wyoming. And then if you expand that to look at out-of-state enrollment, I think, in fact, the university could grow, and I actually think community colleges can as well. Well, the legislature and you were discussing the applied science degree. Mm -hmm. um, it struck me that um, there isn't, there is obviously a lot of co coordination and planning amongst the university and the community colleges, but still the university and Wyoming's community colleges kind of operate independently. Is there a need from your perspective now, to have some sort of greater form of communication and coordination amongst the community colleges and the university? You know, I think, I think strong coordination would really benefit Wyoming higher education in general. And I just wanna uh, say that we have worked really hard these last three years to really improve the relationships between the community college system and UW and then improve articulation and the transfer experience. And I think we've made some really good progress there. But even having said that, it's still a very independent higher education system in Wyoming. And it does make uh, the transfer experience rather complicated because we work with seven different community colleges, all of which kind of do their own thing, more or less. And so often when we're working with students who are transferring, it's a case-by-case -case basis that we have to work with students and it just makes it more complicated. So I'm not gonna say it should be a system because I don't know if Wyoming would like that, but I do think strong coordination would really benefit. In the states, with its fis fiscal challenges today, would that allow an opportunity for greater efficiency? for less duplication? Are those things that you've thought about? Yeah, it would. Greater coordination should allow greater efficiency and it should reduce duplication if done well. Let's talk about the fiscal state of the university. 
I guess I'll ask you the simple question, is it strong right now? It is. I, I really feel like we've managed through the budget reduction um, and we are, we are living in a, um, a uh, balanced budget. And uh, I do think that financially the university now is in a very stable situation. The university, um, people, people look at the university not only from the state of Wyoming, but across the country. You've had the opportunity to understand how your peers across the country view Mm -hmm. the University of Wyoming. How do they view the University of Wyoming? You know, when I'm out across the country, when I go to national conferences or just visit with my peers that are outside of uh, Wyoming, I think uh, they have a very, very high level of respect for the quality of the University of Wyoming. I mean, people understand that it is a university that has been well supported by the state. Um, that it has a very strong faculty that have that are recognized nationally and even internationally for their expertise, um, and that the quality of our education is very, very good. And we're able to do that at a very affordable cost to the residents of Wyoming. And there is a lot of respect for that because there's many other states that are struggling just to do what just what I said right now. So I think from kind of that quality of undergraduate and graduate education in our faculty, it's strong. I will tell you where it's struggling right now is with leadership. And uh, the fact that there has been such rampant turnover of university leadership at this university is really starting to hurt it. And I get many, many questions right now from outside of Wyoming of what is going on. And that's, that's essentially what people wanna know is, my goodness, are you the third or fourth person now and what in the world is going on there? And I worry a little bit about Wyoming in terms of being able to recruit really high quality leadership in the future. Not only administrative leadership, does that impact faculty recruitment? In, Sometimes in it does, because mm -hmm. some faculty are more sensitive to it than others. Some faculty will really look at the leadership at the highest level and, and really observe whether it's a stable place to come. I would say other faculty, mm -hmm. not so much. They're gonna look more at their peers, they're gonna look more at their department and perhaps the dean of the college, but maybe a presidency is not quite as important to them. And so I would say it's a little bit more of a mixed bag there. You've taken a deep dive in how this university gives out financial aid to students. Mm -hmm. And I think you've asked the question, I'm paraphrasing, and I'll give you certainly an opportunity to respond, is are we getting financial aid to the students who are most deserving? Yeah. And what does that mean? Right. Most deserving academically, financially from their situation. Mm -hmm. What have you found? You know, what, what I've found is that while, while the uh, education is really affordable in Wyoming, and it truly is, it, this state has really kept higher education affordable, that uh, once the Hathaway has been administered, there's not much more that we are doing to support our in-state students. We don't have a need-based scholarship program or a need-based aid program. Need based on fiscal need. On fiscal need. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of students who, uh, even though if they get a Hathaway, they struggle to afford college because we aren't helping them any other way from a, a need-based perspective. And I've also found really our scholarship program to in-state students, while we do a little, we don't do a lot. So we have the trustee scholarship, which is a excellent scholarship. It's really a full ride, but we give it to about 100 students in Wyoming. And then after the trustee scholarship, we drop to about one or $2,000 per student. At least as we've really analyzed the data, we, we find that that next level of really strong students are often leaving the state because they're getting out scholarship. Uh, we're getting out scholarship. They're finding better support outside of the state. We actually find that our retention of that next level after the trustees is is quite low. We're not. We're maybe attracting 50% of them, and we should be doing better than that. So, so that's one area is that we really need to do a better merit-based scholarship for students who aren't getting a trustee but are very deserving of something. And then, of course, students who have financial need, we're not doing much for at all. And I think there's something more the university can do to help them. Certainly nationally, you hear often of students' problem with student debt mm -hmm. on graduation, yep. not only for, uh, th through their undergraduate program, but after graduate school. Our student debt uh, at the University of Wyoming is lower than the national average, uh, but I think still about the average debt is somewhere between 18 and 20,000 for students who graduate you know, with a four-year degree. So it's, it's still something that we need to watch, and the more that we can help students, especially need-based students, the more we can help them keep that debt down. You know, one thing I should, I should say about student debt is that 
um, about 60 to 65 percent of Wyoming students uh, leave this institution debt free, and that's an amazing figure. And that's, of course, because of the low cost of tuition and the incredible Hathaway scholarship. So we really still do very well. We do not have a hard time selling the value of this institution. Keeping along the tuition um, vein, if you will, there's been some discussion on how much out of state students should be tar charged to attend school here. Right. Are we subsidizing them too much or not enough? Um, is that where we can really recruit to continue to grow? Yeah. Um, I think there's not agreement yeah. it, on where that number should fall. What are your thoughts on how much out-of-state um, out students should be charged? You know, as our out-of-state tuition rate is still quite affordable. It's not the lowest in the country, but I think we're, you know, in the bottom 10 states in terms of our out-of-state tuition. So it's quite affordable. And I do think maybe the university in the past had a tendency to discount out-of-state tuition a little bit too much. And in fact, in our, our presentation of tuition to the board just last week at, at our most recent meeting, we suggested in fact that we would uh, bring our, our discount rate down for out-of-state students. Um, and charge more and charge more. Mm -hmm. at, the, at the end of the day, asking the students to pay a little mm -hmm. bit more and us discounting that tuition rate down as much as we've done in the past. And I actually still think we can do a very, very good job of recruiting out-of-state students, even if we do that a bit. We're not saying dramatic. We're just saying bring in the discount down, perhaps a thousand or a couple thousand dollars so we can realize a stronger tuition uh, revenue for for the university and obviously then perhaps to turn around and help our in-state students sure. a little bit more. How much were you surprised that the university was growing yet its revenue from tuition was falling? I was surprised. Yeah. So I, I knew when I came and looked at the tuition discounting rate, I knew it was aggressive. I knew that it was high, especially from where I'd come from. So I had that point of comparison and I thought, wow, we discount a fair amount here. But it really took us a year or two to get our arms around how much it was really happening and the fact that we were discounting enough that we really weren't bringing the revenue up even though we were growing. And that's a problem. That needs to be addressed. You've said often that housing is a big hurdle for students yes. who are looking at the University of Wyoming to get over yeah. to decide to come here. The university seems to be marching forward to replace its dorms. Yes, a very good move. I would say strategic and important. There's um, a lot of discussion on how um, compact the dorms should be or whether they should yeah. be spread out. It's a big issue though yeah, um, it is. on this campus. And what, where do, what do you see happening here for building of dorms here that would best serve the students' needs? Yeah, well, I, I would say that in the overall plan as they put that together now, that, we, that the university needs some new construction, that, that we need some new residence halls. But at the same time, I also would encourage them to do some renovation of existing halls. And the reason I say that is because when, we're, when the university is all done with the housing construction that it's working on right now, it probably needs to offer students at least three price points. So, and that could be a higher price point, probably for some of those brand new residence halls that have a lot of amenities to offer, um, which is comparable to what CSU and many other universities are doing probably a mid price point and then a lower price point and just let students and families self-select into which of those price points they'd like to pay. I actually think if we had that to offer right now, we'd have less families trying to get out of living in the residence halls. And we have an awful lot of that happening right now. Um, families so that's, who, who may try to purchase property here. Correct, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. Or even just get out of it and rent because they feel like they can rent cheaper than what we offer to students. So I think having a variety of price points is very, very important. And then in terms of the physical layout of it, I would say, yes, spreading out a little bit would just help students feel like they're not living on top of each other. And this whole issue of parking that we often talk about, it actually would address a little bit of the parking simply because you disperse students in a little bit wider geographical area of the campus. And again, they're not quite so on top of each other. I wonder when parking hasn't been an issue. I know, it's always campus. an issue. <laughs> and by the way, it is at every campus I'm, I'm too. Sure, I'm sure that's, <laughs> that's likely the case. Let's talk about athletics, okay? if we could. Sure. Um, you came from a state that participated in the football level at the level below the University right. of Wyoming in the, in the FCS. Yes. So the FBS, but, and you've watched Wyoming play in football and other sports against Power Five schools and schools of, of lesser caliber. Yeah. Is the University of Wyoming, in your eyes, competing where it should be competing? Yes, it is. 
And, and you're right, I did come. My, lots of my experience has been in the FCS, so I'm very familiar with it. But I think for Wyoming, and I would say this again, based upon my traveling the state and talking to people who love the cowboys and the cowgirls, and who are, uh, and again, one university for the state, I think Wyoming should be in, um, in the bold division, where, right where it is right now. I think it is appropriately placed. I also think it's in a very good conference. The athletic department has a budget of about $40 million. Right. Um, kind of a tough mark for this small state. Yes. Is that sustainable for the, the department? You know, I think it is. Um, the, the state has stepped up and helped when we've asked them to help. And uh, the Cowboy Joe Club <clears throat> is phenomenal. Uh, they raise much, much of that $42 million by themselves through the Cowboy Joe Club and through ticket sales and marketing and other such things. So so I, the most important thing to know is the university does not support athletics to the tune of $42 million. It's probably much closer to, I think, $8 million or $9 million. Of its budget. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And much of the rest is really self-generated re- re- uh, revenue, and they do a terrific job with it. The athletic director recently this year has said it, the department is financially healthy. Would you yeah, agree with that? I would agree. You've taken great pride in your outreach to folks on the Wind River Indian Reservation. Mm-hmm. And in fact, in the fall of 2017, opened the Native American Center. Right. Why has that been so important for you to accomplish? You know, it's, it's just so critically important because Native American people were here first. Uh, they, they are the, the true natives of our state. They are a underrepresented group that I feel like we just have to pay attention to and do everything that we can to help them with their educational goals and to make sure that their people have access to a higher education. Um, I I feel pretty passionate about it. I I did a lot of this work in South Dakota as well, but I I knew when I came that the university had been through a rough spot um, with with a particular high school on the Wind River, um, St. Stephen's. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there was some really raw feelings out there about what had happened. And perhaps the university hadn't dealt with that in a way that at least some of the native people felt we, sh- we should have addressed it in a, in a better way. And so I knew that coming in. I had read about it. I had been told about it during my interview. And I just felt like it was something that I could work on, that that was something I could go out. I could start meeting people, start conversations, meet with the tribal co- business councils, go to the high schools and meet with the, the superintendents and principals and teachers and that I could really start working on it. And I did. And, and I, by the way, I didn't do this myself. Sure. There's a whole team at the university that's worked on this, but I really felt like it was something we needed to work on and we did. And I, and I know three years later, we're in a much, much better place with them. Have you seen that results in enrollment? From Native American we students? did grow a bit this fall, and I knock on wood, I hope that we grow a lot more next fall. But yes, it seems that the pipeline is starting to develop now. You've also, and this goes back to what we talked about a little bit earlier, put great emphasis on the Honors College Yes. in your tenure here. Tell us what you've done. Well, it was an honors program, and uh, which means that the curriculum was available to students, but it was a relatively small program. It was a little bit embedded in one college at the university rather than being held up at a higher level. And it, was, it wasn't well known, it was a bit invisible. And so we elevated it to an honors college, which means that it stands now at a college level, shoulder to shoulder with all the other colleges. And uh, we market it a lot more and it's very, very visible to students. How does the university know that it's offering the majors it needs to be offering, that it's meeting the needs of the workforce? You know, that's a great question. And I think it's something you have to constantly be analyzing and watching. And the best way you know about that is to talk to the employers of the state. So as we are in touch with employers across the state and and listen to them about their needs, we then should bring that back and look at our academic programs to say to ourselves, are we, are we producing those kinds of graduates? Do they have the skills and the knowledge that's needed to go to work in, in Wyoming. And in fact, as we went across the state and talked to employers, we found that perhaps there are a few places we were missing the boat. Um, and one of those we've immediately addressed, and that was with our tourism industry. Uh, when, when we know that it's our second industry from a revenue standpoint mm-hmm. in the state, and we know how many jobs there are out there, we came back and I asked the question, 
why don't we have a tourism or a hospitality management degree of some kind on campus? Because my goodness, there's a lot of jobs out there. And so in fact, we did bring that up. Uh, we brought up a outdoor recreation and tourism management degree, which went live this fall and in fact has 50 students in it already. The goal is for it to have a couple of hundred students in it when it's fully developed. So, um, and then our business school is right now looking at adding a hospitality management minor to its curriculum. So coupled together, that would be a very strong uh, set of courses and skill set for students to have. So that was the first one we looked at. We also talked to employers that are more in the engineering construction area. And they said, you know what, in construction management, we go down the road to Colorado State and we're hiring almost 100% of our employees right out of Colorado State. And I thought, why aren't we offering that? We should be doing that. So we will go live with a construction management degree this fall. We expect that to be a very popular major and there's lots of good jobs out there. Dr. Nichols, we have a little bit of time left. If I were to give you a mulligan, any do-overs? Well, I think there's always things that you look back on and maybe you wish you would have done a little better. Um, and there's certainly some of those for me. I think maybe in some ways, I wish I would have handled this last legislative session maybe a little bit better than we did. And by that, I mean what we asked for budget-wise, how we worked with the legislature. We had just come off of our budget cut. We were kind of resettled at that point. I think in looking back, maybe I would have handled that just a little bit differently. But um, would I totally redo things differently? I don't think so. People wonder about your future. Do yes. you want to be a college administrator again? I think about that from time to time. You know, I've really only had about two months for this to all settle for me and for me to think about my future. Um, do I think I might like to do it again? Yeah, I think maybe I will. I'm not sure that I'm really ready to be totally done with higher education yet at this point in time. I enjoy leadership. I enjoy being able to come in and assess a university and try to help take it to a stronger place. Um, and if the opportunity comes for me to do that one more time, I may jump at it. Well, Dr. Nichols, I can't thank you enough. Every time we've asked for a moment of your time, you've graciously granted that. Your communications department has worked closely with us and has been nothing but accommodating. You've helped us to meet some of the faculty members here on this campus. Good. And we are very, very pleased to wish you the best of luck. Thank you. I really appreciate it so much, Craig. Thank you for visiting with us. Funding for this program was provided in part by the Wyoming Public Television Endowment and viewers like you.